Sometimes in life, you throw something away that's really important. At the time, it may seem small or insignificant, or you just don't know what to do with it. It's only later on that you realize just how truly important it was. This was something that I discovered one day when I was walking the streets of an isolated town in northern Santa Barbara County. So the year is 2008. It's the height of the Great Recession. I turn a corner and I see a line of people baking in the California sun. Me, I'm on day three of my new job as CEO of the food bank. Got my new badge. I'm feeling good. I'm going to feed the world and the world is going to be grateful. So my first move is to check out one of our food distributions. And so I follow this line that snakes its way to a weather-beaten church. And the scene inside is one of mild chaos as food bank employees scurry back and forth in a dislocated dance, trying to fill two bags of food for each family, one of cans and dry goods and the other of fresh produce. Now, most people seem grateful to receive the food while others frankly emit a low-level anger at being kept waiting so long in the hot sun. Suddenly I'm thinking, the badge is not such a good idea. <laughs> CEO, chief excuses officer. So people collect their food and they exit out the side of the church. And so I follow behind and I see this guy surreptitiously slip something into the big dumpster on the side of the yard. Now, I've seen a lot of movies, uh, and when something like this happens, it can only mean one thing, a big bag of cash. <laughs> and the food bank could use that cash. So like many movie heroes before me, I make the fateful decision to take a look. I raise the lid, and what I see amazes me. And like many movie heroes before me, my life changes forever at that moment. Sure. There's a bag, all right, but it's not a bag of money. It's one of the food bank's produce bags stuffed full of fresh vegetables. What? I open up the other lid of the dumpster, and there's half a dozen identical bags, each brimming with fresh cauliflower and squash. I don't get it. These folks are the working poor. They need healthy food more than just about anyone. And it's not a cultural issue. These produce items are acceptable across all the cultures that we serve here. And yet, people are throwing away the good stuff and holding on to the cans of franks and beans with added salt, the peaches in heavy syrup. You know, later on, I actually saw somebody trade a perfectly good head of cauliflower for a packet of ramen noodles, truly the walking dead of nutritional foodstuffs. <laughs> it was like a punch to the stomach. I had to find out why people would throw away perfectly good food, the best food. Well, the most profound answer that I have come across in the 11 years since that day is this. Just giving people more food does not end hunger. It sounds counterintuitive, right? We should just be able to throw more food at this problem and make it go away. And that's exactly what food banks like mine have been doing for decades now. And yet the numbers of hungry and food insecure people remain stubbornly high. So what I discovered that day when I lifted the lid on my dumpster of destiny was not just a waste of food. It was a classic case of food illiteracy. What? Wait, what's that? Well, we're all familiar with reading literacy and with numeracy. If you don't have those skills, you go through life with one hand tied behind your back. You can't read the fine print on your car loan. You can't question the inaccurate calculation on your paycheck. Food literacy is just as vital. Without a basic level of food literacy, our health suffers day after day after day. Our bodies may throw diabetes, cancer, heart problems, and obesity at us just to get our attention. So maybe everyone here learned food literacy as a child around your dining room table in your kitchen. We were all the brave volunteers, right? We were forced to taste test whatever miracles or messes our parents concocted for us. Maybe you even made the ultimate sacrifice and helped out. But many kids don't have that opportunity. 
I spoke to a boy in one of our programs, and he told me that besides holidays, he never sees his parents at dinner time. They're always working. I asked a girl, tell me about your kitchen. She said, my kitchen is a microwave oven in the hallway by our front door. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. And another, that his dining room table was his lap in their minivan in the drive through lane of the fast food restaurant. Suddenly, that bag of produce with its big, hard head of cauliflower and these ridiculously oversized squash are not looking so useful given the reality of people's dinner plans. So I hope that you're beginning to understand that hunger is complicated. Hunger is hard because being poor is hard. So how would I know, Mr. Guy in his flashy hat and the pinstripe jacket? Well, I know in a small way because for one month every two years, I live on food stamp money to just try and find out what it's like. So I get $6.46 a day for 30 days. And during these periods, I've done things such as sleep in my car, cook with struggling families, eaten in homeless shelters, and planted home gardens alongside struggling seniors, all to understand in some very small way what it's like to face these challenges every day, and maybe how to find some solutions. Now, full disclosure time, I live in Santa Barbara. <laughs> it's known as the American Riviera, TM. <laughs> That's right, I live in a registered trademark. <laughs> there is incredible wealth here, yet also an astounding amount of hidden hunger. It lurks in apartment buildings, in student dorms, and in classrooms where kids can only focus on what is not in their stomach. So when I bring my eight-year-old daughter Mia to the Kids World playground downtown, an incredible one in four of those laughing, chasing children is living in poverty. Not money's tight, but bone-crunching, quick-sanding poverty. Across America tonight, one in eight people will open up the cupboard doors to see what's there for dinner, and there's nothing. So this situation comes about because people are working this crazy quilt of multiple jobs and income streams just trying to get by. They spend all their money on rent, on utilities, on prescriptions, and the cost of endlessly repairing these Frankenstein cars that need more and more new pieces bolted into them to bring them back from the dead. In this situation, healthy food is the first and often the only thing that can be cut from the family budget. So if I don't have much money, I buy poor quality food. If I eat bad food long enough, it makes me less healthy. I'm less able to work, and so I earn less money, and so I buy even poorer quality food it becomes a vicious downward spiral. That spiral is not just theirs, it's all of ours. The price of poor nutritional health in America is astronomical. It's over a trillion dollars a year. And yet the simplest and cheapest way of keeping people healthy is through what they eat. It's crazy, right? So let's just keep throwing more food at the problem. But like I said, just giving people more food does not end hunger. We need to equip people with the skills to take that food and make their families healthy with it. Now, food literacy is not a magic recipe to, end, uh, to solve poverty, but it is a powerful answer to some of the attendant health problems and a vehicle for empowerment and transformation. So to live in poverty is to live in what has been called the tyranny of the moment. We're so overwhelmed with all of the problems that we're facing right now that we don't have the mental space to plan for the future. Food literacy is a key tool to smash this tyranny. So if I have basic food literacy skills and just a few dollars in my pocket, I stand a much better chance of being healthy that month. It's really important for them to do that. So, I've been very inspired by uh, what people have done with food literacy. Um, across America in the 1960s, there was an incredible campaign to try and boost reading literacy. And teachers stepped forward uh, to teach, and the lives of those teachers and the people that they taught were changed forever. 
Today, I would like to invite everyone here to join me in a new campaign, this time for food literacy. Let's help people be as healthy as they possibly can be. So in Santa Barbara, we're already doing things. Our food bank runs national award-winning food literacy programs, such as FLIP, Food Literacy in Preschool, and TLC, Teens Love Cooking, where we get real teenagers, we give them real knives, and we step back <laughs> in amazement and for our own safety, as over a period of weeks, they turn into real cooks and prepare an incredible graduation fiesta meal for their parents. We're also piloting a new high school food creativity lab that allows teens to have insane amounts of fun with cooking and eating together. So maybe, just maybe, it's time to rescue that poor, poor, benighted bag of produce from the dumpster. Come on, it's okay, you can come out, it's okay. <laughs> we could take that cauliflower and make popcorn cauliflower with chili and lime. We could take the squash and make taco stuffed squash boats. Kids can be mini Godzillas lifting up their vessels and munching them mercilessly. But it's not just down to kids, there's things that we can all do. So you don't have to go out and sign up for anything. You can start with food literacy in your own home, in your own kitchen. You could teach your own kids, your own grandkids, how to be food literate. It's fun, and it's a lifelong gift. And so I really encourage everyone here to consider food literacy as a way of helping everyone in America be much healthier than they are. We can help people be healthier. One food literate generation can beget another. Isn't that a powerful gift to give our society? But to do so, we need to equip people with those basic food literacy skills, the ability to budget and plan for meals, to shop smart, to cook in a quick and healthy fashion, and then crucially, to make use of leftovers. That sounds mundane, but it's absolutely vital, just like basic reading literacy and numeracy. So I welcome and I thank you all. Thank you.